seated. God bless you. Get as comfortable as you can. Praise God. Yeah, man. Thanks for making us honorary members. And uh, we're with you in the spirit, that's for sure. We do get a chance to talk to your pastor from time to time by phone. Even uh, we had a couple of conference calls, I think, with the leadership. And uh, so it's exciting. And I'm glad, always glad to hear the great reports. And then looking at you this morning, you almost packed out here. So uh, it'll be interesting as you formulate new plans on every you know, step of the way. Praise God. I really enjoyed this morning's teaching as well, um, and I couldn't help but think of the, uh, when you got to carrying on about the blood and the water, I mean, that's the real deal. And it, you know, it's amazing how the gospel goes um, not understood or misunderstood, where in the simplicity of the gospel is the fact that it was the death, the burial, and the resurrection that made it all possible for us. Um, yeah, the blood and the water and the spirit. I mean, you know, oh, I'm not. It was a teaser. That's right. You're not. That's all right. But I want to add to the teaser by uh, reminding you of of an interesting parallel in the scripture. The pastor mentioned it in um, John 19:34. The uh, soldiers had come to the. Uh, other prisoners that were crucified on either side of Jesus. And um, they were breaking their legs to hasten their death. They were just hanging on um, to the last breath, and it was taking too long, and the Sabbath was coming. And so the Roman soldiers broke their legs. That was kind of a thing that they did. And it just made it even, brought death even quicker. And they, when they came to Jesus... They didn't have to because they found that he was already expired. But one of the uh, soldiers, to make sure of that, plunged his spear into the side, like the pastor said, and out there, out of that wound, came forth blood and water mixed. Now, the parallel, one of the parallels, of course, is that the blood and the water were mixed. They came out together, meaning that you can't separate the blood from the water. You can't, you can't say that you're truly repenting which is symbolic of the blood unless you're really ready to be baptized in the name of Jesus otherwise you're disobeying the command to be baptized in the name of the Lord which is not repenting so the blood and the water have always been mixed that's been the that's been the metaphor throughout the scripture but there's one other aspect that uh, I don't I haven't heard very much about and that is that um The book of uh, 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us about, and he refers to Jesus as the last Adam. There's a first Adam who was earthly, and there's a last Adam which was spiritual. And he was referring to Jesus as the last Adam. And I've always connected that to the fact that there's also, since there was a first Eve, there must be a last Eve. And since there was a first Adam who had a wife whose name was Eve... Then the last Adam has a wife, which is the church. And when you think about the way that Eve was created, it's really fascinating because the Bible says that God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And then he opened up his side. And out of that side, he took a bone and from that bone, he built this perfect bride for Adam. And when she was finished, he presented her to the man and they became one flesh. So the first Eve passed through the side of the first Adam. And I think the last Eve needs to pass through the side of the last Adam. And if you pass through that side, that means you're going to pass through the blood and the water. And without passing through that blood and the water, you can't be part of the bride of Christ. And when she's finished, when he's finished building this church through his side, then he'll present it to himself and will be happy ever after. I, uh, back in the late 70s, I think, very, very late 70s, uh, there, was a mis- there was a pastor here in Maryland of our group that went to the nation of Malawi as a missionary. 
And a couple of years after that, um, the man you know as the bishop uh, went over there to visit to do some preaching, some crusades, and uh, made a couple of different trips, and he brought back these astounding reports of this great revival there. And um, anyway, that kind of just it was part of, the, part of God's plot and strategy to, uh, to have us finally land on the same soil over there. And so I really uh, am indebted to the way that he worked everything together and had uh, my pastor at the time able to go to Malawi in kind of central, east, east central Africa and um, kind of paved the way for us going in 1984, which is when we left Antioch and became full-time missionaries in, in Africa. Uh, we had a lot of interesting experiences. I remember one time I was driving down to, to have some services in a, in the, in a place called uh, Chikwawa, down in a valley. And we, where we lived was a town called Blantyre up in the mountains, very nice and cooler temperatures. But we had a lot of churches down in Chikwawa. And to get down there, you had to drive down kind of like these, was, uh, what do they call those things? Uh, switchbacks. Yeah, and you had to work your way down this escarpment to get down into the valley where it was usually hot, etc. And I learned one day on one trip that this, there was a certain dynamic in the rainy season. That was when it rained in the mountains, it would manifest itself in the valley. I mean, I grew up in Indiana, so we didn't have mountains and valleys. So uh, I'm with Pastor Chicopa one time, and we're driving along in this two-wheel drive vehicle that we had. And we came down from Blantyre, and we're down, down the switchbacks and down into Chihuahua, a couple of hour, two or three hour trip. And we're tooling along. We have some great services down there. And then we're headed back. And um, as we're heading back, you could see, in fact, when we left Blantyre, it started to rain. And I hadn't thought of anything about it. But as we came back, or let me say this, on the way down to our destination, we had to pass through three riverbeds. Not so wide. They're just kind of, kind of empty and sandy. And you just kind of go through them, no problem. Kind of might need a push here or there because we didn't have a four-wheel drive vehicle. But on the way back, when we got to the first one, it was wet. There was water coming through it. And then we got to the second one, and it was really starting to fill up. And we got through it by some guys standing around on the side of the road and seeing us in this condition. We went down in the water and couldn't go any further, and then they began to push the car. And I shut off the engine, and I put it into first gear, then I would just bump the starter. And just, you know, oom, 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 and they'd push and push, and we got through that one just barely. And I knew there's no way we'd make it through the third one. So time had gone by, it was getting late, and we stopped at the third place and figured we'd just have to camp there in a village near that little river crossing until things got better. So that's what we did. We pulled over into a, to a village, and we looked around, wandered around, met some people, and they said, well, just stay here. I mean, this Malawians are awesome people. So we're kind of camped out on their porch there, and we ha I had this little red junior size accordion. And so I got the accordion out, and the sun went down, and it started to get dark, and I'm playing these simple little little three chord songs and pushing the buttons, you know, and carrying on. We got to singing and just singing these songs in, in a language of Malawi, which is called Chichewa. One of them is called... Uh, oh, they're gone. I thought maybe they might know it. Anyway, there's one called... Uh, Chikonde Chayesu, which is uh, the, the love of Jesus. It says, Chikonde Chayesu, Ndi Chopamba Nazedi. And then the that's the leader of the song. And then the, the audience responds with kind of the same word. Chikonde Chayesu, Ndi Chopamba Nazedi. And then the leader says, Chikonde Chayesu, Ndi Chopamba Nazedi. And then you answer, Chikondi Chayesu, Di Chobabana. And then he says, E Taunani, which means, Look, behold. Ie Anafera Pa Mtanda. I got a helper somewhere that's going to put the word Mtanda on the screen because I want, you to, I want you to see these little coincidences that are so interesting in life to me. We'll get it in a minute. It's a Chichewa word that's spelled M-T-A-N-D-A, -A, Mtanda. And it means the cross. The song says, you know, the song started out saying, the love of Jesus is very deep indeed. And the audience responds, the love of Jesus is very deep. And then the leader says, the love of Jesus is very deep, isn't it? And the audience says, the love of Jesus is very deep, 
deep indeed. And then the, guy, the leader says, behold, and the, and the congregation sings, he died on the cross for me. There it is, Mtanda. He died pa Mtanda, at the cross or on the cross. So Mtanda is the word, the Chichewa word for cross. And interestingly enough, I mean, there it is. And I, I was teaching one time in Malawi, and I got to looking at this word Mtanda. And there's another word that is Manda. It's, like, it's exactly like Mtanda, except it doesn't have a T in it. It's just Manda. So I looked, you know, I looked at, I was looking at Mtanda and looking at that T and I thought, you know, Mtanda means cross and that T looks just like a cross. And if you take that T out and end up with Manda, Manda is the word in Chichewa for grave. Wow. Wow. Isn't that an amazing wow. coincidence? Wow. And that's what the Malawians said. Wow. wow. Actually, they were kind of wild because they had never discussed that before. But I think they also felt a certain pride in the fact that their language contained that kind of coincidence. That's our language. <laughs> Mtanda, and you take out the T, you have Manda. Eh, nditu, chikondicha yesu. You know what? Anyway, I'm always, I, I'm kind of, obviously I'm, I'm a strange guy because I see this stuff it seems like I see this stuff a lot, these little coincidental things. There's one in English that's pretty amazing. <laughs> if you turn the word live backwards, it's evil. Weird, isn't it? It's weird. In Matthew chapter number 24, Jesus is speaking. And he says this, down in verse number 37. Jesus says, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage. You know, that doesn't sound bad when you read it at first glance, but what he's really saying is a reference back to the book of Genesis, which we're going to go to in just a second. And it was really bad. This eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage was not just what you would normally consider eating and drinking and marrying about. It was to a riotous, horrible, evil excess. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. And so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now this is not a, you know, it's not so much of a doomsday passage or a doomsday message as, a, as an exposition of the human condition. The reference to Genesis 6 shows a it talks about the contrast between God's complete perfection and man's wickedness. God's love to desire and care for us and take care of us and look after us while we are bent on seeking some kind of individual sovereignty and ultimate freedom from everything. Genesis chapter 6, to which Jesus was referring. Let me start with verse number 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. And by the way, this is, this is nine generations from Adam. In only nine generations of humanity, they have taken the perfection of God's creation and turned it into an absolute wicked disaster. Nine generations came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, everybody that may have been considered oriented somehow towards God, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, they saw the other side of humanity, that they were fair, they were beautiful is what it says in Hebrew, and they took them wives 
of all which they chose. And literally what it says is they married as many of whoever they wanted to marry as possible. They took these women at um, their desire. They made them wives. And, you know, the interesting thing to me about that is this. When Adam made, excuse me, when God made Adam and Eve, he made them to be one couple. He created them male and female. In the beginning, that's what he created. The very first institution on the earth that God brought forth was the institution of marriage. One woman to one man, male and female. And then, just a few generations later, we read where Lamech, one of the descendants from Adam, takes more than one wife. I don't know what caused that except the human condition, the human desire. This carnality that was, all, that was inherent in man because of the fall. He just said, I'm not going to have one wife, I'm going to have two. But when he did that, he overthrew the institution that God had set as a precedent. This is the way it's supposed to be because every marriage between any man and any woman is symbolic of the ultimate marriage between me and my future bride. And God's only going to have one bride. So they've overthrown this institution of marriage in chapter 6. Finally, they've done it. It's done away with. It doesn't mean anything to them anymore. So the Lord said in verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. I'm not going to continue in this struggle that is a, it's a daily experience. Men all around this earth that I've created and told them to go and replenish the earth and multiply themselves and and live according to these principles. What I now find myself doing in my relationship with man is nothing but striving with them. Every time, every day, every in every human being on the earth, I'm struggling inside of his spirit. I'm trying to touch him through his spirit, and it's nothing but striving against their desires. Every day becomes like a burden to God. It's not what he meant it to be. They have totally corrupted what he wanted to do with humanity. He wanted to be their father. He wanted ultimately to be their husband. He wanted to be their king. He wanted to be their their protector. He wanted to be their deliverer and their healer. Their comforter. He would do anything for them. But what he finds himself in in the the place of is striving against man. I'm striving. I've got to to try my very level best to just almost force them to do my will. But he can't force us to do his will. I used to shock African leadership classes or conferences or seminars that I taught in various countries in Africa by stating at some some point along the way, I would say, "You, you men know, of course, that there is something more powerful than God. And, well, I'd always get a terrible reaction to that. Oh, brother, that's my... Something more powerful. Yeah. Especially those preachers with that big voice. No! They thought I was, you know, being sarcastic and, you know, they were trying to sneak out a wrong answer, trying to get somebody to say Amen. But there is something more powerful than God. (laughs) All you've got to do is say no, and he can't. I want to save you. I want to fill you. I want to use you. I want to ordain you. I want to anoint you. I want to send you. I want to bless you. I want to recreate you. No. Can't do it. Can't do it. you got God's hands tied. Somehow, imagine, imagine the conundrum here. Imagine this situation. God, the Almighty, creates something. The thing that he makes to save has the power to reject the salvation. If that's not the ultimate plot of the ultimate story, I don't know what is. (laughs) I can make anything from you if you say yes. You never know know where this adventure is going to take you. 
Never know. I mean, good and bad, what we look at and try to figure out, this is horrible. This is, what I'm facing is horrible. And yet God says, hang on, and you'll see what the other side in just a little bit. Or we look at it and say, this is lovely. And God says, just hang on, you'll see the other side in just a little bit. <laughs> Here's what I want. And God says, okay, but let's talk about what I want. Okay, Lord, sorry. But not in Genesis 6. All he does is strive. Every turn with every, with every body, every single soul. It's nothing but striving, striving. The minute he tries to even suggest something, they reject it. He's been totally abandoned by his own. Days of Noah. The Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man because he's flesh. In fact, he's not just flesh. You know, he's supposed to be flesh and he's supposed to be spirit and he's supposed to be soul, but this, this he's turned it into all flesh. There's a spirit in there, but it can't de- you can't discern my presence and his soul is totally corrupted by the actions of his flesh. It's as if he's nothing but flesh. It's as if they've taken what I made perfectly and just turned it all into flesh. It's just completely humanity now. Verse number four. And then end of three says, so, so in 120 years, things are going to start to change. So he puts a date on the flood that they don't even know about yet. Verse 4 says something really bizarre and, and translators and Bible scholars are trying to sort this thing out. And they, you know, they've argued through centuries over this kind of stuff. It doesn't make any, doesn't make any difference. It has no bearing at all on the, on the reality of the situation. There were giants in the earth. They probably weren't giants. These were probably just people that had great stature, but they were, they were giant in the way that they were warrior-like and, and able to accomplish things in their own way, in their own right. They were just aggressive and they were powerful people. And after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them and these became mighty men, mighty people that just felt like they could do anything. But verse 5 says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And listen to this. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Let me read it from the NIV. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Now I want you to understand this. I want you to get this. I want you to to just imagine how bad this is. He saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become that every intent of the thoughts of every human heart was evil all the time. Everybody was corrupted. Now I know that people have preached to you that Noah was singled out because he was just and righteous and following God. I don't believe that for a minute. He was in the same human condition as everybody else, but we're going to discover one thing that makes a difference. See, we're all in this thing together. We've all been corrupted the same way. We've all committed the same sins. We've all committed the same degree of sins. (laughs) Brother, I never liked cigars, but I love, loved. Man, I almost said love, didn't I? (laughs) But I love getting high. That wasn't a cigar I was smoking. <laughs> and we rolled them big in those days because they weren't as potent. They were, they were being grown illegally. So it wasn't quite as potent unless you had a really lot of money. You know, I see all these news reports of the marijuana factories and it's just that, but these big bag, these big bins full of buds. I'm thinking, man. <laughs> I didn't get buds. I mean, that was a rare deal, you know. Couldn't afford buds. I went out one time with some friends and walking down a river and we found a natural grove of it. A natural grove of wild hemp. And we harvested it. 
crazy. Crazy man. <laughs> Took it home, you know, hung it upside down. You're trying to get the, you know, trying to get all the good stuff to flow down into the leaves and, you know, hung it up in a closet. We well, can't just hang it out in your living room. You know, it was a felony in those days. It was horrible stuff. I mean, we had to smoke cigar after cigar and you get a buzz, you know? It was crazy. It doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I know some people just appear more righteous than others. Give me a break. We're all, we're all from, the same, from the same human... No, you can't hear me. We're all spring from the same human condition. It's the same condition. It's just that we look for different stuff. Some people get sloppy drunk and they can't ever seem to get out of it. Some people get high. Some people steal. Some people kill. It's horrible what goes on. Horrible. We lived in, when we lived in the Congo, one, one of the words you, hear, you heard much too often were the words my, my. It referred to a rebel organization called the Mai Mai's. M-A-I dash M-A-I, Mai Mai. And it meant Mai was the Congo Swahili word for water. So really what their name was water water or powerful water because they believed that by witchcraft when they went into battle bullets couldn't do anything to them. It would pass through them. Bullets would, bullets would become like water and just hit them and then spread you know, disappear. It was, it was wild. It was crazy. My, my. You say, my, my, and people say, ooh. My, 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 my came into our part of the country and they destroyed village after village. They were, they were terrible men, terrible men. Born out of the same human condition that you and I are part of. Same condition. But they took it out on their fellow man to a degree that is almost beyond human imagination. They cut off people's hands then they'd dry the hands by a fire. And then they'd string the hands together with a string. And they'd wear them around their necks. They would cut off various parts of women's bodies and dry them by a fire. And string them on a string and wear them around their necks. And when they came into villages, sometimes they would cut off the victim's hand and cook the hand and make him eat the hand while he's bleeding to death. And the effect of it was absolute terror in the hearts of their victims. People were terrified of the Mai Mai's. And you can see why. All restraints are off. And this is what humans can do. Here we are, sophisticated America. Give me a break. You give us the right conditions and this place would be as ugly as the Congo. You cut off the water long enough and cut off the electric, cut off the food supply and the shelves are empty and you'll see what the human condition does. God saw that the wickedness was, of man was great in the earth and that every thought, every imagination, every imagination of his heart was only, only evil continually. No wonder he's just striving, with, he's striving with men. Terrible, terrible stuff. And it's just the human condition. That's all it is. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24. As in the days of Noah, when God was striving with men, as in the days of Noah, where every thought of man was only evil continually. You know, we flew a plane in, in Africa. When we got to the Congo, that's the only way you could get around. So we had this little Cessna, little six-seat Cessna aircraft. And every time I'd fly, we'd have to get a report on the Mai Mai's. Can't fly there, Brother Gross, because of the Mai Mai's. Sometimes I flew into a place and I would expect army to be guarding the, guarding the, the little bush airstrip. And sometimes guys would step out of the bushes. I didn't know who they were. They didn't have boots on. They had bare feet. They had some kind of raggedy looking uniform. They had an AK-47 and bandoliers of, of 30 caliber shells all around them. But who is this the army or is this the Mai Mai? Somebody asked me one time, did you ever get shot at while you were flying? I said, I don't know. But there weren't any bullet holes in the plane. So they must have missed. What 
What about America's total godlessness? What about what we've taken with all the institutions of God and just thrown them back in his face? You know what all this stuff that's going on is, all this liberal stuff that's against Christianity? You know what they're really trying to do away with? It's not about, the, it's not about freedom to marry whoever you want to. That's not the issue. The buried issue is demonic. The buried issue is the Bible has no veracity. The Bible has no truth to it. The Bible imposes no conditions on, on humanity. So, which, so let's get rid of the, of, the, of the institutions of the Bible. Let's, let's undo the word of God and then we'll finally win. Win what? Total depravity. So, nine generations and here we are. Verse number six. The King James says that it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. The word repented there in the Hebrew actually means that God was sorry that he had made this creature. God looked at, God looked at the perfect creation that he had made and he was sorry that it had come to this. This is not right. It was so strong in the eyes of God that he was grieved in his own heart and he decided to take action. I'm going to destroy this. I'm going to start it all over again. The Lord said, I'll destroy man that I've created from the face of the earth. I'll, I'll destroy man and beasts and the creeping things and the fowls of the air because it repenteth me or I'm sorry that I have made them. And then the most remarkable thing in the book of Genesis, but there's so many great passages in the scripture that begin with the word but. Things going great, but. Things going horrible, but. But Noah finds grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace. Now let me tell you something. Noah's a sinner. He's not a perfect guy living as a hermit on a hill and praying to God all the time and just moving in the spirit. He's been corrupted. He's in the same human condition. But somehow Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. What on earth does that mean? Listen to me. Listen to me. In spite of this human condition, in spite of the human condition of Genesis 6, all God was looking for was somebody, somebody that would respond one time when God spoke to him. That's all. No quality of Noah involved here. No status of Noah involved. No money, no intellect. It wasn't anything like it. Was a, it was just part of Noah's, the last vestige of, of human character. One man on the earth can respond if I speak to him so he found grace in the eyes of God. Now listen to me closely, okay? I said, you know, I got a great laugh when I did my marijuana stuff with you. I, you know, it is kind of funny now, but there's people struggling with it to, to the nth degree now. I mean, they're struggling. They're addicted to it. You know, we used to tell ourselves, you, you can't be addicted to marijuana. They used to, they used to preach to us, you know, back in, in high school, and, and, you know, that if you start on that stuff, it'll just lead to the hard, it'll lead to the hard stuff. You know, all, all heroin users started off on marijuana. I said, well, that's nice. Well, all drunks started off by drinking milk. So I guess we ought to get rid of milk, too. So, you know, in those days, don't preach to me that marijuana was addicting. But it was addicting. Because the human condition demands stuff like that. I can check out a little bit. I used to go to work stoned. I'd get up, get high, go to work. I'd get high during, during work because I had the cheap stuff. It didn't keep me high that long anyway. <laughs> Come home, what are you going to do? Get high. Man, smoke, smoke, smoke. Smoke yourself to death. Are you addicted? No ways. I can quit anytime I want to. I got home from work one day, couldn't hardly breathe. I was coughing so hard. I'd get up in the morning, because I was smoking cigarettes and smoking pot, you know. I said, man, this has got to change. i got to quit something. What would you quit? I quit cigarettes. <laughs> man, 
What a formula. Got a nicotine problem? Here's some weed. Doesn't have any nicotine in it. And it's not addicting, according to Grossbach. Sure it is. Of course it is. All this stuff's addicting. Why do people steal? Why are there gangsters? I mean, I know. I know why. I, know, I, I, know, I understand the cultural thing. I understand that. I understand that. You know, you're born in this condition. You're born in this, you're born in this ghetto or whatever it is. You're born in this, in this kind of climate, this kind of culture, and so you do what everybody else does, and you're looking for, to get ahead, and you're looking really what you're looking for. Really what people are looking for is to be loved and accepted. Because that's the vacuum in the human condition. We want that from God and we don't even know we get, we get it from Him only. So we look, at, we look for it in other people. And whatever kind of people will adopt us and love us and show us respect. And don't disrespect me either. Disrespect will get you killed. Crazy. Crazy. Don't diss me. Boom. <clears throat> Drive by. I mean, what drive by? What? It's addicting. It's addicting. That life is addicting. It gives me status. It gives me my freedom. It shows what kind of a man I am. Whether I steal, whether I smoke, whether I'm a drunk, whether I beat my wife or kick the cat or whatever it is, it becomes addicting. That's what I that's what I do because I can't get right with God. Why not? Because I don't I don't respond to God. And all the time he's there. I want you to notice the paradox of this great God. I want you to notice the paradox of this. The paradox of God, and you touched on it this morning, the paradox of God's omniscience. He knows everything. Can you get your mind around this? He knows where you're going to end up for eternity. He already knows. I don't mean that he's forcing you there, but he knows where you're going to go. So even though you're headed to a devil's hell, he'll do everything he can to your last breath to keep you from going there. That's a paradox to me. If he knows you're going to go there, why try? Because he has to try. Because he's God. And his grace is available to you. And if you just stop saying no, everything will start to change. Noah found grace. So God speaks to him. Noah, build this boat. I'm going to use you. I'm going to save you and your family. And we're going to start this thing again. Noah finds grace. Noah found grace. So the story of the days of Noah is really just the story of every man. It's the story of every man. That he's got to be given every chance, though he'll fail. He's got to be given every freedom from God's perspective, though he may descend into bondage. He'll be given every blessing, and though he may misuse and abuse them. And that in the very worst of the human experience, Noah can discover the grace of God and change forever. You know what Noah's name means? It means rest. Some people translate it as comfort. So really the story of Noah is the story of finding rest. And it all starts by understanding that the grace of God is extended to you right now, right this very moment, right this morning on March the 4th, 2018. And all he's looking for, not really, he's not looking for religious scholarship and that kind of, not looking for perfect living, he's, not, he's just looking for somebody That'll respond when he calls. That's it. Whether you're a my my or you're a useless guy like I was or you're a good member of society, he's just looking for people that will answer him from their place of the human condition. Let's stand together. Praise God.
You know, I suppose somebody could try and build a case for sneaking into heaven. I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to prove it. But I guess you could use things like, well, you know, Christians are humble. They're not spotlight grabbers. It always tickles me when, when Christian, um, what are we, performers. Can I use that? When Christian performers grab the spotlight. When they're, you could, it's, it's, their whole spirit kind of cries, give me the spotlight and give me the chance. and Turn up the volume and that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. So the real Christian spirit is is a humble one. So I guess you know for this sneaking your way into heaven, you could you could maybe you could say, well, you know, because we need to be humble and we're not in the limelight and we just kind of quietly get our way into heaven. That's all well and good, but here's the deal: when it comes to starting the journey, you got to use a little bit of boldness. You got to be willing to step out from the crowd. You can't be saved in the crowd. You got to step out from the crowd. When I left Antioch and went to Africa, I found myself in a place where I was the answer man. I became the answer man. <laughs> you know, here, uh, you could always point to somebody else. You know, when you were asked a hard question, you, well, you might want to see the big senior pastor. We didn't call him the bishop then, but, you know, I wish we could because then it would have been easier. Oh, you better see the bishop with that. But over there, I became the bishop. I had to have the answers. So I had to dig my way into the scripture like never before. And I had to know that what I said, when I, even if it was a traditional answer in the past, I had to know that it was strictly biblically based. You know? And, and just even, even the things that we did, even the, the, the Christian culture, traditional things that we did in church services, I had to be able to defend them scripturally because why else were we, I mean, why are we doing this? You know, somebody began to ask me about altar calls, and I thought, man, I, I, where am I going to find an altar call? You know, how, you know, we give altar calls, you know, altar calls. You're called to the altar. You're called to the front of something. And then I began to realize that even though they may not have had former, f- formal altar calls in the Scripture, they were altar call moments that are described in the Scripture. Right. And when Jesus ministered to the crowds, he only made progress with individuals that he called out, that he noticed were willing to respond because they found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It may have been a guy that climbs up a tree so that he can see Jesus walking by, but in climbing up that tree, he made a statement to God as he passed by that, I want to know. He didn't say it too too much out loud, but Jesus saw it in his heart. Zacchaeus, Come down from that tree because today I'm coming to your house. Single him out. Fishers of men. Found on the Sea of Galilee. You know, Peter and Andrew fishing in a boat and Jesus says, you know what? Come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And the next verse says, and immediately they dropped their nets and followed him. That was their altar call. (laughs) He just singles people out. So here we are. Here we are. We're all equal. We're all equal. I don't care what you've done, and you don't need to care what I've done. Because we're all in the same human condition. And the only difference between one human to another is, where is he in the grace of God? Has he found favor? Yes. Has he responded to favor? I don't know. So I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to make a bold statement. I'm going to ask you to to just show yourself and God. You don't have to show us. Show yourself. I'm serious about this. Jesus, I'm serious about this. I don't know much. I don't know much. If I, you know, I learned a lot this morning in Bible study with the pastor. But I still don't know that much of a relationship. And I want, to, I want to know you more. Well, just single yourself out of the crowd and start making your way down to this altar. And we'll rejoice with you. We'll pray with you. Because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Not because of his goodness, 
But because God knew that buried inside that man in the most wicked generation until now, he knew that there was a potential response to his favor. I want to change your life, Noah. I want to make you new, Noah. I want to do it all over again if you'll just give me the opportunity. Praise God. Praise God. Close your eyes. Raise your hands. Begin to talk to him. Lord, help me respond. Help me respond, Jesus. Help me respond. I want to. I just don't know how this morning. Help me. Lord, help me. I'm addicted to this and I'm addicted to that. I don't know the way forward. I don't want to be just like everybody else anymore. I want to step out of my human condition. And I want to know you, Lord, in the power of your resurrection. Hallelujah. Praise God. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Get your your eyes off of somebody else and get your eyes on Jesus. We can't save you. What we do here can't save you. But Jesus can save you because you found favor in His eyes. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I know that means that in God's sight, he found grace, but it also sounds like he found grace by simply looking in God's eyes. Jesus. Hallelujah.